Okay, so for the past couple of years, I've been starting to think about issues of um, resilience, largely because that's a sexy word to put into a grant application. Um, but um, and I've been thinking about it in terms of question of uh, late medieval urban decline and the idea that towns <coughs> declined in the period after the Black Death and. Um, I've sort of played around with a few ideas, a few theoretical ideas, and um, come up with some um, some approaches to thinking about this. And one of this, one of these approaches, um, looks around the idea of anticipatory action. And so I thought it might be useful to start off by thinking a little bit about the relationship between archaeology and resilience, and how resilience has played into um, archaeological. Um, Research. So I think probably the most obvious area in which we see people talking about social and economic resilience is in terms of, sort of processual approaches to systems collapse, particularly in a sort of Mesoamerican context. Um, but also increasingly we're seeing, particularly through environmental archaeology, um, <coughs> considerations of ecological resilience as well. But what I think is characteristic of the way that a lot of archaeologists have approached um, the concept is that they've seen it as a model, as a system, a sort of general laws, predictive model for either understand, explaining why a particular passage of events happened. So, you know, the place got too big and it exhausted its agricultural uh, hinterland and therefore it lacked sustainability and resilience. Um, or say, taking a model such as this one of the uh, adaptive cycle um, and trying to apply it to see if it's a model which is appropriate for a particular archaeological period. Um, and fundamentally, um, the approaches that have been taken, I think, have, have been characterised by seeing resilience as a means of preserving elements of a social system or a socio-economic system, rather than thinking of it in terms of adaptability. And that comes in part from the history of the concept of resilience, which started off really uh, as a biological um, concept in terms of ecosystems and ecosystems balance uh, and seeing whether uh, an ecosystem could bounce back and, and retain its form after a trauma and as it's been employed in geography in particular uh, and the social sciences where well, they've taken the view well you know was it the um, definition of idiocy is doing the same thing over and over again and actually that concept of resilience isn't actually very good because if you keep having to be resilient then you're not that resilient and actually adaptability is uh, a more pertinent concept. And also there's a problem in terms of defining <coughs> resilience. So there is this basic um, definition of sort of bounce back ability, um, the, uh, the ability to retain the original state or to adapt but also, as the concept has been used and employed in lots of different disciplines, it uh, has become used in multiple ways, come to mean lots of different things, and actually become to be lots of different things, as the geographer Ben Anderson uh, has outlined in his paper in the journal Politics. So Anderson traces, for example, in political discourse, how ideas of resilience are used as dogma. We should aim to build a resilient society um, as policy. Um, in terms of it being a focus of what um, government and people in power are doing, and also the power dynamic of thinking about who is defining what should be preserved, where we want to be developing resilience, and where we don't need to develop resilience. And that's something which I want to come back to a little bit in this paper. And he shows, really, that um, resilience in all its forms is a very complex concept and actually having a series of general laws um, of the kind that, um, that biologists might use, for example, really homogenise the concept and make it much more of a blunt instrument than it can be. So I've taken a little bit of inspiration on looking at the relationship between resilience and power from some work undertaken by the historian Daniel Curtis. Uh, and he was interested in the resilience of pre-modern agricultural societies. And he looked at um, a number of, sort of economic indicators from historical records and produced this um, model whereby you have um, different styles of uh, power structure uh, sorry, and um, power over resources. 
So polarized and egalitarian, um, persistent and dynamic. So effectively, um, whether the power structures allow adaptability and then has shown whether um, those societies are likely to be vulnerable, highly vulnerable, resilient, and highly resilient. So he considers the most highly resilient to be egalitarian um, communities where the power and the ability to adapt is yeah, it's much more ready to adapt, whereas if you've got a much more um, polarised society where you've got top-down power structure, that's likely to be vulnerable because um, it's very short-termist in its approach. So he identified the power structure as being key, really, to how um, vulnerable or not communities were to trauma. And thinking particularly about their ability to adapt, whether they were being long-termist or short-termist, and also whether there was a communal interest, whether people were sort of looking out for each other and working towards a common good, or if they were being subjugated by a lord or some other authority who was only really interested in their own interests, and as long as they were making money, they were happy. So we have a realisation here, um, both in this work and in um, Anderson's paper, that um, resilience relates to power. And this is something which is um, common in a lot of uh, writing on resilience in political science and in the social sciences. And so the fundamental question, I think, comes to be, what is being preserved? Who decides what's being preserved? And to what end? And that's probably a question that could also have been asked in the session on heritage values on Monday, actually. Um, so going back to Anderson, um, I found his um, paper uh, published in a geography journal um, on anticipatory action to be particularly helpful in this regard, because it moves from <coughs> homogenising models of trying to um, fit behaviour into something like that adaptive cycle, to rather to think about behaviour, to think about the steps which societies are taking to preempt any kind of trauma, and also to adapt to that trauma as well. And it allows us to think about the power structures at play, because these processes of resilience building and preempting, um, but also of adaptation, can come from the top, but they can also come from the bottom up. And if they're coming from the bottom up, that has potential for new forms of power over the future to emerge, because that's really what we're concerned with here, is uh, anticipating potential futures and making sure that the outcome is the future that you want. So in terms of power, it's whose future is emerging. And unsurprisingly, I have uh, also tried to um, develop a framework which takes the anticipatory action approach of Anderson uh, and looks at it through the lens of um, assemblage thought a little bit as well. I'm not going to talk too much about assemblage thought here, uh, but I think it's, it's useful, uh, particularly in light of Kevin's uh, paper earlier on, um, just to, to mention it briefly, um, because something which I think is lacking in a lot of archaeological applications of the right, on the writings of Deleuze and Guattari is that fundamentally their assemblage thought was about power. And they didn't want to take the modern capitalist way of the world and replace it with something else, but they wanted to try to develop a framework in which we could see alternative systems of power um, come in and um, upset the, uh, the social order. So as such, we can see this concept of assemblages, of uh, constellations of people and things caught up in processes advancing through space and time uh, in real and virtual form, as we heard about in Gavin's talk, as being productive productive of agency, but also productive of power. So power becomes something which emerges out of relations rather than something that is just imposed upon them. So if we see uh, the medieval town as an assemblage, we have to see the medieval town not as a bounded static entity, but as a process similar uh, to um, how we were being asked to perceive the shop of work, and we draw together uh, the people, materials, the documents, all of those things which make up the town and also overflow the bounds of the town. So whilst it's um, typical to see power in the medieval town as sort of top-down in, in the hands of a burgess or mercantile elite, um, rather we can think um, through uh, the assemblage approach as seeing the power emerges out of the relations which constitute the town. And rather than being prior to those relations, uh, we can see um, urban life as generative of different forms of power and in this case, power over the futures and the ways in which a place might emerge. 
So, uh, again, unsurprisingly, the place that I'm going to be talking about is medieval Southampton, uh, which has been the focus of most of my uh, research. I've used it as a sort of unfortunate laboratory for lots of uh, balmy thinking uh, about medieval towns. Um, and uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the medieval period, um, so in the 13th to 14th century, which is the period that I'm focusing on here, Southampton was a major port. It had a fairly homogenous economy, which if we're thinking in terms of those adaptive cycles, a homogenous economy is often seen as something which makes a place vulnerable. It was very um, reliant on the fact that it was a major port, uh, and its economy was largely a service economy geared towards uh, the port. It did, however, have a high degree of political autonomy. It was granted a borough charter quite early on. It has a guild merchant, which maybe extends back into the Anglo-Saxon period. Um, so the Burgess elite of Southampton were um, very uh, powerful. Now we can think that as having a homogenous economy and a polarised power structure, that Southampton might be quite vulnerable to trauma. But it survived the disruption of the Black Death, uh, of warfare and of a French raid, which I'm going to come back to talk about. And it became an important port in the 15th century, although it's important uh, in this regard to realise that its importance as a port shifted. Rather than being a place where merchants were based, it became an entry point for Italian merchants, and that has also implications for whose futures were unfolding and long-termist and short-term strategies. So I want to look at resilience building at a number of different scales. Uh, and I'm going to start off with uh, thinking about waste deposition and hygiene. So um, this is a random pit, late medieval sex pit, from a site in the French Quarter of Southampton. I picked it purely because I found a picture of it, um, and it has this nice annotation on it that it, it's filled with cess and then a layer of domestic uh, and building demolition dumping material. So in a dense, uh, densely populated urban centre, disease is obviously a major concern, particularly in the 14th century with the issue of the Black Death, and therefore waste deposition and management uh, were critical to maintaining standards of hygiene. Um, so archaeological research, both stratigraphic and also environmental evidence, and this is another reason why the French Quarter is good, because they threw uh, the environmental everything at it, so they, they've got uh, sort of insect analysis and all those sorts of things, which really show very careful management of waste, of filling and sealing of pits. Um, and I think we can see this as a means of controlling the vibrant materiality, to use Jane Bennett's um, term, uh, of waste. Waste has the potential to disrupt. Uh, in this case, it has the potential to be a, a medium through which disease can um, spread. And therefore, by managing that waste, you're preventing its um, vibrant materiality from being realized. It's creating a power over the material. Uh, and we can see this as a bottom-up process performed at the domestic um, scale building power over the environment, over the urban environment. Um, moving on to the question of the French raid in 1338. So, um, so this is a sort of more settlement-wide um, concern with uh, futures and power. So Southampton's um, defensive frailties were revealed in the early 14th century when the men of Winchelsea came and attacked uh, the port. But nothing was done to strengthen the defences, despite the fact that the king was making lots of noises that they really should. And then 1338, um, French um, fleet came and landed in Southampton, raided the town, um, pillaged, stole, burnt down, all those sorts of things. And this raid was met with little resistance. So we can say, right, they had a warning. Why didn't they preempt this attack? They knew that we were at war on a war footing with France. We knew that they had defensive vulnerabilities. Was it not in the interests of that Burgess elite to protect the town? And the answer is no, because building new defences would effectively have cut off the waterfront from the town. It would have disrupted the daily rhythms of port life. So we have pressure being exerted by the crown to strengthen the defences, and this is creating a political tension because the Burgesses want to be able to go about their business. In a sense, they're quite short-termist. Um, they're only really interested in trade being able to continue and in making money. The Crown wants to protect Southampton as an important um, port for mustering um, fleets going over to France uh, and for importing raw wine uh, and those kinds of things. 
So we can see here that resilience building is a payoff between different interests and it's historically contingent. So if Southampton didn't have that high degree of political autonomy, then we may have seen a different future unfold. So the defences may have been strengthened, Southampton may not have been as vulnerable and may not have been attacked. But because of those historical processes which have granted that power, um, we can um, see uh, uh, the future which unfolded as coming about. But the aftermath of the, uh, the raid reveals a little bit more about the ability to adapt. So the impact of the raid was actually quite uneven. It hit the mercantile areas which are around the waterfront the hardest, um, and um, it's here that we see in the archaeological record uh, evidence of dumping deposits from uh, building demolitions and that sort of thing. Everybody in the town um, suffered from an economic downturn, uh, which was really associated with broader factors as well. But maybe we can see the non-mercantile population as better able to adapt. They had a more varied economy. They were craftspeople, labourers, um, and so forth. And actually, they were in a way able to benefit because they were able to find employment, rebuilding houses, and those kinds of things. Um, but there was also a central, um, central uh, edict to uh, invest in building and new key facilities. So we can see different elements of the urban life being more resilient than others. So certain things, certain rhythms uh, of the, the labourers, the, the non-mercantile people um, persisting despite this trauma, uh, but the mercantile um, population, the people who in theory had the most power over the future as being the most disruptive. So we can see the power over the future which emerged, not being just in the hands of the Burgesses, but being in this sort of web of connections which constitute uh, the town and its wider networks. Because urban processes overflow um, their bounds. Towns can't be bounded entities. They, uh, if we sort of follow Manuel de Landa's uh, view of the city as, a, as a, a slowing of flows coming together and sort of congealing into the form of, of the town, um, then we can um, see the town as deterritorialized, as overflowing its bounds. So key to Southampton's recovery, as I mentioned, were Italian merchants and um, the wool trade, which is what they were really interested in. And in the 15th century, this, this trade was largely in the hands of the foreign merchants. And in response to the demand, we see rural landowners in Hampshire and in the surrounding counties really intensifying wool production, um, in part due to a shortage of labour as well, and sheep being cheaper than crops, uh, but also being uh, really um, profitable. And we also see cloth towns developing, uh, particularly on the estate of the Bishop of Winchester, whereby they're trying to control the whole process. They're, they're rearing the sheep and they're doing the conversion of the, the wool into cloth. So we can see this maybe being uh, um, an attempt by people like the Bishop of Winchester to build resilience to their, um, to their economic um, subsistence by um, controlling the whole process. So when we look at these wider networks, we see that the trade was out of the hands of the Southampton merchants, the people who on paper had the power over the future of Southampton, and resilience building outside of Southampton by people like uh, the Bishop of Winchester and his officials um, had implications for the futures which could uh, emerge within the town itself. So power over the urban future also emerged outside of Southampton, and like urbanism itself, uh, this process of uh, power emergence was a distributed one. So we see short-termism by the Burgesses, we see their investment in keys. In the key, we see the hospitality of the Italian merchants, but they're building an economy which isn't really sustainable, and by the 16th century, Southampton again was suffering from decline. So what I've tried to show here, and I um, don't know how successful it's been, is that Whilst it's possible to model resilience, it doesn't actually explain the outcomes. And instead, if we think about behaviour and the implications of behaviour, then we can start to think about the anticipatory action uh, and the anticipatory actions which are taken at lots of different scales, from the, the minuscule, from the domestic, uh, like the control of rubbish, right out to international networks of trade, global networks. So what we can see by thinking about anticipatory behaviour is conflict and um, conflict emerging out of power plays which don't necessarily reflect the perceived official power structure. It's not those, whilst those who are in power 
think they are the ones shaping the town and the future, we actually see that power is over that future is emerging out of lots of different people anticipating different things, seeking to protect different interests, and really creating a sort of messy bundle of, um, out of which lots of different forms of power emerge. So all of this, I think, creates opportunities to think about how communities protect their interests and how they are able um, to shape their futures, even if they uh, are acting in ways which seem to contradict um, the sort of overarching power structures. There we go. Perfect. 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 Perfect.